Well, hello world, it's John G, Modern Design Aquascaping. I'm back again with our water feature design series about water in motion. This is my final installment number four about water in motion. And today I am going to talk about water in motion and how it relates to a negative edge. I'm gonna share with you how to properly design your negative edge in order to minimize water in motion. I'm also gonna share with you at the end some tips and tricks that we use in our negative edge design to get it nice and tight and to keep the fish from jumping over the edge because nobody wants jumpers in their pond. Just saying, stay tuned. All right, kids, take your seats. <laughs> this time I pushed record, so I'm gonna share this information with you. Boom, water in motion, negative edge design, let's get to it. In the previous videos, if you haven't watched them, you need to, there's a link up there. They're gonna tell you how to calculate water in motion in a stream, how to figure out how much water is in one inch on the surface of your pond. All of that is covered before. I'm not going there again today. So let's talk about a negative edge real fast. You have water in motion in your stream, number one. Headwaters, call them what you will. There may be pools, ponds, everything. I've already taught you how to calculate that. You then have a pond. This is your pond. All right, number two, you have inches in your pond. Each inch is important. You then have whatever your spillway looks like here and a waterfall, however big, that goes down into your underground reservoir this creates the negative edge right here. If you don't know about that, there's another link right up there about negative edges. Watch that video, come back to this one. We're all on the same page now. Bam, here you are, you're back, awesome. All right, guys, this is what we got. You got this moving water. You got this per inches. You're gonna figure three inches of your water minimal is gonna fall down into your reservoir. Do your calculations. You figure out all your water in motion, three inches of water in your pond, all your stream, you add that together you multiply it times two, times two. That gives you your reservoir. If you're not good at math, multiply it times three because you're bad at math. And then if you get it wrong, it's really a drag, trust me. So you're doubling all this. That's it, easy peasy. The main component here to our conversation is how important it is to design this properly because the amount of water that you lose off the surface of your pond is dependent on number one, your flow rate of your pump, how much water you're actually moving, dumping in from the top. Obviously, the next thing that's gonna be important to you is how wide this is, where the water comes out. The factors, if it's running through a little channel, it's gonna be thicker, you're gonna have more water. And the last thing is how tight you design this so that you don't have a lot of seepage. And I was working on a water feature with a friend not too long ago and I did calculation of water in motion on his pond. It had a 3,000 gallon underground reservoir, guys. That sounds enormous, right? Not really. I figured out the surface area of his pond between the stones in both directions and every inch of water that he raised his pond level up cost him 675 gallons of water out of his reservoir. Now, you know, I just told you, if you have a 3,000 gallon reservoir, right? You can only have one half of that in motion. That means he could have a maximum of 1,500 gallons of water in motion, guys. And if he was right on it, and I told him at that time, if you jack this up right here, and it puts an extra gallon of water in, or an extra inch of water in motion, you are gonna have issues because this 1,500 is gonna turn into almost 2,200, which leaves you a mere 800 gallons of water in the bottom. And on a big feature, what you can't afford is you can't afford for the power to go out and 2,000 gallons of water goes rushing over the hill. Guys, that's a bad design. It makes you look stupid. Get it right, just saying. All right, Squirrel, let's talk about this design right here. What we've learned over the course of time in order to get our negative edge super tight to minimize the amount of water in motion. All right, chillins. Let's start this out from a side view so that this makes a lot of sense to you, okay? Here is what we'll call your negative edge. This is the area where your water is skimming off the top of your pond and it's spilling down. This is the magic of the negative edge. This is what pulls all of the surface tension. No bubbles, no pollen, no nothing. 
on top of your water. Crystal clear sheet of glass. It's amazing. Okay, but get this right. So in the beginning, we would pile gravel. We'd put a big rock on the edge to create a waterfall and we'd pile gravel. But as you know from previous videos, this gravel holds water in it. It dams the pond up. The pond might drain down to liner level when the power's off, but it then has to fill up to gravel level. It's then going to fill up above gravel level and you're going to end up with four inches right here in your pond of lift before the water is really running good over the negative edge. That's how we started. That was bad. Then we came up with some other ideas. Let's try flagstone. So we went on to using a sheet of flagstone. So we're back to here's your waterfall, here's your negative edge system. We started doing our rock here, putting flagstone all the way across, which works pretty good. But you got a lot of flagstone. Um, design tips for me, I don't like the negative edge to be short because when my fish get up here, I want them to stick their head up there and realize that they got to travel for a ways in basically no water to get to the other side. I don't want them to see the waterfall right there and dump over the other side because you think fish are stupid, but they're really not that stupid. Well, goldfish are stupid. But sorry guys, you got goldfish. They're not as smart as koi. In my experience, maybe I've just had a bad luck at the draw. Squirrel. Anyways, so the flagstone trick works good. We go right on the liner and then we put gravel and foam to protect our liner in here. What you don't want is this area becomes a travel way for people walking across the pond, people doing service work. Anybody that's going from one side of the pond to the other can easily walk through this area where there's one inch of water. And uh, so it becomes a traffic area and you don't want to create a situation here where you have potential abrasion to put holes in your liner over the course of time. So we do right on our liner and then we do a piece of underlayment, not rock pad, just one thin piece of protective underlayment. Nice, smooth flagstone on top of that. Thin, like one inch thick flagstone. And then we put that gravel in there. We'll shoot a bead of foam in between the flagstones like mortar. And then we just push some gravel down in. Now what you have is you have a situation where they wiggle a little when you walk on them but there's nothing getting pushed down into your liner. There's no liner exposed anywhere to the ultraviolet. I've seen people take the liner and try to put a little loop in it right here so that it's actually a lip to hold the water so that you don't lose that. Don't do it because you end up with a fold. You end up with an exposed nub of liner along that edge and that's a wear point. That's a weak point in your design, it's a flaw, and that will be the part that fails. It will end up exposed to UV. It will end up getting walked on, chewed on, not, whatever. It's just, it's not good. Trust me, we tried it, and it's, I mean, it works, but it's not the, the long-term answer. I'm gonna show you that right now. Here's the design I like to do now. Here's your, your edge as it used to be, okay? Here's my rock framer, one flagstone, for the fish, it's gonna be the same, but I'm gonna create a dip here in my excavation that's a couple inches deep so that I've got one flagstone. I've got gravel here, but it's backed up by liner so that it doesn't let the pond down. This is all gravel. Now what you have is you have a clean look where your rocks in your pond look nice. You still have gravel. You don't have this big, huge area of flagstone which is kind of hard to disguise and you still have liner comes right up to the bottom of the flagstone all the way across guys this is how we achieve a, a tiny bit of water in motion this keeps our water level one inch to two inches depending on flow right here and one inch right here for our flagstone and our flagstone area bleeds down very slowly. So if it's a one hour, two hour power outage, we're not even gonna lose this inch of water because we make this tight with the foam and the fabric. So it's a slow seep right there. You literally have to have power outage for like an entire day in order to lose this last inch. It's very infrequent that that, that, that happens. This is, this is my go-to design now for negative edge. Now that you know how I make it work functionally. Let's talk about what I do in order to keep the fish from flying over the edge. This is the part I'm gonna share with you that I've learned over time. I hear a lot of people tell me, all our fish go over the negative edge. We have problems with our fish jumping over the negative edge. It's not a good design because our fish go blah, 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 blah. No, I don't have that problem in my design. It's because of the way we build the negative edge. 
This design looks great where it goes into the pond. Again, I'm gonna tell you, I do distance here. You want as much distance of that negative edge. Looking from my top view of my negative edge, it looks like this, guys. This is got coming in, here's a rock, here's a rock, here's a rock, here's a rock. This is all my negative edge. I mean, I might have stones in here and plants. I got stuff, it doesn't look stupid. We make it look good, but it's a distance, the run from the pond that where the fish has to get up into an inch of water and it has to, it has to go all the way over the waterfall on the other end. And typically on, on these things anymore, I don't even mind that the drop can be two inches. It just gotta fall off enough to skim the surface debris and the pollen down into that lower area. But this is important. The run, the width, the wider you make this negative edge, the shallower the water will be. And that's important. You can cram it down and make it into a little fast moving river, but a fish is gonna get in there and he's gonna ride the gauntlet all the way to the end. Get him up here where he has time to sit there and think about it, and they almost always go back. The other thing is, looking back from the, from the side cutaway view is, make this edge vertical to deep water. So if you have shallow here, a fish is gonna be tempted to just get right up in there. Let's don't encourage that behavior. Think like a fish, guys. I'm not gonna teach you in this video how to whistle like a worm. I'll save that for later, but I am gonna teach you how to think like a fish. Right here, build your rocks on this edge. Do it vertical so that a koi can come in and his habit is to go up and be vertical. It's much less prone to go over this side. That's one of the tricks we use. We use width, we use length, we use depth at the edge to encourage fish to stay in the pond and not go over our negative edge. I hardly ever have it happen. Right after we build a negative edge, I tell people, watch your pond, come out and check every two or three hours we will make sure that the reservoir has a little standing water in it in the beginning. And once in a while, someone's fish will go over, pick it up, put it back in the pond. They learn. I'm pretty sure they go back into the pond and tell all of the other fish, guys, don't go there. It's bad because it just stops. It stops happening. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Do me a favor. If you learned something about water feature design and construction that was valuable to you, give me a thumbs up. Tell me that you liked this video and that it was worth watching. If you've got questions, comments, concerns, anything, interact with me in the comment section down below. I want to help you win with water features. And by all means, subscribe to our channel. Ding the bell, you'll get notified immediately every time I put out a water feature related video, educational or inspirational, either one. I appreciate you watching. And by all means, follow my boys on Facebook because they are a faster, smarter, younger, better looking version of me. Saying, peace out, y'all.